It gives me a great pleasure. I'm going to do this presentation in English. Um, the PowerPoint, I've decided to put it a little bit together. The PowerPoint will include also some visuals uh, that I've been able to collect over the last 10, 15 years. A lot of stuff coming from the books. You know that sometimes one picture is worth a thousand words. So maybe I'll speak a little bit less. Let the pictures speak for us. So um, let us begin. So first of all, to introduce uh, my paper, I just want to say that this is a humble attempt on my part to analyze the early beginnings of the UOCC, then known as the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada. This was the official name at the very, very beginning. And to provide some general framework of how the religious institution was reborn, restructured, and re reinvigorated on the basis of a strong, and I believe a revitalized roots that happened on new soil, that is Canada, within a new, unique beginning. Also, this paper will look at the ethos. The first third of the paper, I'm going to give a little bit of a historic background. Then I want to talk a little bit, um, most of the paper will be on the ethos of, of the church. Uh, attempt to follow through almost 100 years in Canada. We'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary in 2018. And I know that some people will say, well, the first Orthodox came probably in 1892. So we can do the same argument as yesterday. Is that a thousand years of Ukrainian Christianity or is that 2,000 years? The Ausan of the Kodet. But what is important for me to want to witness uh, what has been fostered and maintained. We want to take a look at um, the span of four waves of immigration. And also, I think we can easily say that in Canada and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, we've had between four and six generations of families of this tradition. Ukrainian settlers began arriving in Canada in about uh, 1891, is the official year that our Canadian government uses, from both Halachina and Bukovina. The religious life in Canada and the pioneers was richly organized at the very beginning and celebrated as an important facet of the homeland landscape early church buildings, Naroni Dume, etc., etc., but also was impoverished as its official ecclesiastical statutes status does not uh, due to the lack of a coherent leadership and clergy. By the way, we've got two statues here that are in Halichana. One is uh, the one that's on the far is the one the Canadian Congress put together in 1991, and it's in the town of uh, Nebeliu in Halichana. And the other one is the one that the Soviets put up uh, approximately, I don't, I couldn't find the exact date, but it's in Berezio. And this statue honors our Halichana that came. But you notice what is interesting here when they give the list of the uh, four major leaders that left Berezio. Negrić, Genek, Bodrug, and Arsenic, and then they wrote here, Osnovnike, Pashuk, Ukrinske, Shtil, Chitane, Hazak, Ukanagi. No mention of religion. 1970s, Ukrainian style. A little bit of geography. The early settlers of Canada from Halachina and uh, Bukovina came from three major regions that we can call sort of the north part of Halachina and the southeast. And from Bukovina, as you can see in the map on the far side, they came from the northern part of Bukovina, sort of the northeast corner. But when they came to Canada, before they got the land, we got basically a very strong tradition of what we've known as uh, the ten block settlements. Alberta had one, Saskatchewan had four, and Manitoba had five such block settlements. And the idea of the block settlement was that the people could live together, close to each other, they would be separate, they had their 160 acres of land, but that they could, in fact, build community institutions like um, churches in Rodney Dume and Chitagni, etc. The population is kind of curious. In 1901, there were 27,000 settlers, and boom! Within uh, the next 15 years, we're up to 130,000. You're not dealing with millions of people, but we're dealing with a significant population. When Canada's population was at 7 and 8 million, we had 130,000 by World War, um, World War uh, uh, One. So a little bit about the early history of our church uh, and the beginnings. Um, Ukrainian settlers in Canada began arriving. Their religious life was not initially without leadership. One of the big problems in Canada was that the elites, the church elites, did not come to Canada. The priest, the bishop, there was a lack of clergy. And also then when the Ukrainian Catholic Church started sending clergy, most of the clergy was celibate, 
What were people used to in the villages? They were used to a married clergy. So there's a little bit of a disparity, a disjunction of the time. I'll give you a nice little quote here from Missionnaire, where people were actually very thankful for the, you know, the land and everything is going well, but spiritually they were impoverished. So in other words, and this also comes through in the Book of Indian Letters, um, the University of Chinuzi produced a book on the uh, letters received in Chinuzi from Book of Indian in Canada. Meanwhile, community life was initiated, early churches were built, and there's a couple of examples of an Alberta church, uh, and also the one that's the oldest church in Canada, St. Michael's, uh, you bring the church in Gardenton. The very first institutions, the early clergy came from the United States, and many of the clergy came from, um, from the Ukrainian Catholic, and of course they celebrated the very first pastor we have in Manitoba, an annual celebration of the very first liturgy, was celebrated around Dauphin area, and so as a result uh, we have these visitors uh, coming to Canada. Uh, for the Ukrainian Catholics, of course, it was a big problem. They didn't have the clergy, and eventually a small group of eight arrived, some um, priests and some monks and a couple of nuns, and this began the hierarchy for the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Okay? Metropolitan Andriy Shaptisky visited Canada for the Eucharistic Congress in Montreal in 1910, and he was very, very <clears throat> pleased when he took his trip across Canada. You can just imagine him traveling from Montreal to Alberta. Has anybody been on a train lately? Anyways, a um, little bit of color comment. Um, but anyways, he two years later appointed Nikita Budka, and Nikita Budka came to Canada. So in 1913, the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Canada, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic, they called themselves Rutenska Pro, Rutenska Hrakatolska Tsarka, was comprised of 21 bishop, 19 priests and monks, of which nine were Belgian or French. It is curious that the Vatican, with the support of Shabtitsky, was able to convince a number of French monks and also Belgian monks to become biritual and becoming biritual to come to Canada to serve the uh, Ukrainian Catholic community. Uh, the Belgium and the French were kind of a mixed bag. For some communities, a priest is a priest is a priest. But many people still longed for that married clergy. The early Orthodox priest was surprised by the Russian Orthodox mission in North America. <laughs> a fair number of their priests were Ukrainian, born or educated. And they came especially from uh, to Alberta, <clears throat> from Seattle and San Francisco, and to Manitoba, from Minneapolis. <coughs> now, we've got the two churches, but yet we've got a couple of other interesting things happening. In 1903, there appeared in Winnipeg, with the aid of a, an agent of immigration, um, a certain monk by the name of Serafim, who quickly became a bishop, and of course, he created the All-Russian Patriarchal Orthodox Church, often referred to as the Serafinska Tsarka. And he was later succeeded by uh, an imposter by the name of Bishop Makari. They indiscriminately ordained many clergy without training, celebrated pompously the Byzantine Rite for a fee, launched their Tin Can Cathedral, you can see it uh, right over here, the second one from the bottom, and um, they, they eventually succumbed to failure due to various indiscretions, alcoholism, debauchery, etc. But you can see here that there was an experiment. By the way, um, Serafim went back to Russia to try to get his, his status clarified. He came back and many of the people had given up on him. And of course, Makari continued with this church right up until 1913. But this church is basically wiped out. Very little is left of it. And by 1920, it basically disappears. Secondly, we have the Presbyterians in Canada are trying to create and reaching out with their tentacles to assist the members of the intelligentsia of our Ukrainian community and created in 1904 the so-called Independent Greek Church. Kind of a nebulous title, Independent, Nezalazhna, you know, from who? From the Ukrainian Catholics, Ukrainian, from the Orthodox. Greek, well, it's Byzantine, right? But there's a hybrid of Eastern Christian practices and Protestant theology, but their basic agenda was to Canadianize and to assimilate <coughs> the new Ukrainian immigrants. This tradition soon had a significant following in Manitoba, but by 1911, the Presbyterians decided to, to basically embrace 
Uh, the Ukrainians wanted, they wanted Ukrainians to embrace Presbyterianism, and their numbers declined. By 1925, with the creation of the United Church, a small number of United Church parishes survived and, um, until the early 1950s, but they were never a major shaker and mover on the spiritual side of uh, our Ukrainian community. Among the chaos of the religious life, a small group of intelligentsia known as the Narodolci began to exert their influence by organizing and empowering rural teachers, bilingual school system, establishing a newspaper, Krinsky Holos. Um, they introduced the concept of Bursi, we've got to educate our kids, our students. They established in Saskatoon uh, and in Edmonton. Um, but basically, I found a very nice definition of the Narodotsi in Oris Martinovich's book. The Nationalist Narodotsi program was designed for immigrants materially comfortable, enough to ignore socialist appeals. There were socialist appeals in Canada for radical social change. It sought to rid Ukrainians of manipulation by missionaries, party agents, the Liberals and the Conservative Party in Canada really wanted to bring under the wing all the ethnics. And in Manitoba, especially, we had a big fight also with the Franco community. So they were basically against that. And uh, their program rested on what we would call four major pillars. Non-sectarianism, bilingual education, economic self-reliance, and political uh, independence. So this becomes the group that will, in fact, work together and facilitate the creation of uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada. The Narodovsi soon entered a major clash with Bishop Nikita Budka over the issue of religious leadership as well as national leadership. These two were sort of intertwined. Uh, included here was the problem of the registration of parishes under the Episcopal Corporation. The Ukrainians have built churches. They're probably somewhere between 80 to 100 churches already established. And it was a form of trusteeship. Now the bishop wants to, in fact, bring in under his Episcopal um, um, Corporation. He issued a letter in 1914 um, about conscription and working with the Austrian-Hungarian side of the war, which led to problems. He wanted to create an innovative <coughs> church constitution. He was basically in favor of clerical celibacy. He didn't want to push the envelope to talk with Rome to perhaps to you know, bring in a few married pre priests. So the Dirinavodosi decided they could not work with the bishop and started looking for alternatives. So we have an alternative that basically is put forth. Um, some of the alternatives discussed, and this was done over a couple of years in Ukrainsky Hollis, was to create a Ukrainska Narodna Tsarka. The Poles have one, why can't we Ukrainians? In northern of Winnipeg, we still have a Poiska Narodna uh, Other forms of independent church, but not Protestant, or to begin the possibility of exploring the recreation of Canadian soil of the Orthodox tradition. Dobre. The Narodovci. By the way, I really have a lot of respect for them because when reading this literature, they were risk takers first class. And you know, church life, we think many times a little bit on the conservative side. So these people were sort of outside the box. A special group of 30 of them, headed by Vasek Sistun, decided to call a confidential meeting, Dobirochny's Zbore, on July 18th, 19th, 1918 in Saskatoon. They invited Bishop Nikita Budka to come to discuss the Tsarkovde Betanya, but he refused to attend. But anyways, this group of Narodotsi got from the prairies 145, 154 delegates who came out they were challenged by the question of a Ukrainian church in Ghana. At the beginnings, in all the records, they never say Ukrainian order. After three major speeches by statisticians, the Stone and Arsenis immediately decided to proceed to organize a Ukrainian Orthodox Brotherhood. So the first institution created by these Narodotsi was a Bratz law. And to begin the process of organizing the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada. So, six key agenda items. I'm going to be referring to them later. The new church was to be in full communion with other Eastern Orthodox churches on the basis of a unified dogmas and rites. Only married clergy would be permitted. You can see the swing here against the celibacy. 
By the way, that swing lasted well into the 70s and 80s in Canada. All parishes would be organized on trusteeship basis, parishes owned by the parishioners, and to be in control of their finances. A support of clergy and laity, including the Brotherhood would elect bishops from qualified candidates, so suborno brownies, they want to have a sabor on a regular basis. Parishes would have the right to appoint and dismiss clergy. Um, Ms. Coleman, Dr. Coleman talked a little bit about that in, in the 1860s in Cave, so we've got that in tradition here too. And they also wanted to begin to prepare the aims and objectives of the church, true new church. They wanted to incorporate the statutes of the church, they wanted to establish a seminary. Where are we going to get these clergy? We're not getting them from the outside, from Ukraine. But maybe we should do something to prepare our own. To organize and accept parishes, except already established ones. So in other words, parishes of both the Russian mission plus the Ukrainian Catholic could be entered into this new fold to provide clergy for the parish and to prepare and convoke the first sabor of the church. This ambitious program, if you really take a look at it, <clears throat> 100 years ago to prepare such a program, but all done by laity, no clergy, I think it was pretty heroic, uh, if I could be personal at that. The ambitious program was headed by a presidium of nine lay people, three per Perry provinces, you know, they, they wanted to be equal, and the big head of the Bratstvo, and he was the head right up until the 30s, mid-30s, was Vasej Sistun, and there's his mugshot. The presidium had as a challenge to put in practice six major principles and provide a statute, and basically um, to begin that process of creating a church. In addition, the Brotherhood was immediately immersed into polemical debates. In Canada, we had polemical debates. Polemichna literatura. I took a course at the University of Manitoba, Polemichna literatura, 16 stolit. But we had also polemical literature here in the 1910s and 20s and into the 30s. Fortunately, the Brotherhood had a strong support of the Ukrainian voice, to make most of his major, major pronouncements. The first support of the church was held six months later, in uh, December of 1918, and this uh, support, the first gathering, decreed um, to establish formally the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada. So one of the big challenges was, um, you know, how do you get a bishop? So initially they turned to the Russian Orthodox Mission in North America, Archbishop Alexander Nimolovsky. He turns them down because this is a Ukrainian phenomenon. He doesn't want to leave his mission. And of course, this is the time also of the Russian Sabor of 1917-18. So then the Ukrainians in Canada reached out. They heard that there was a, a patriarch of Antioch bishop in North America by the name of Germanos Shehaki. And they appealed to him, wrote him a letter to New Jersey, asked him to accept, you know, the Episcopal, what we can say, leadership, and he did. And so as a result, uh, what we have, he arrives and speaks and is a formally accepted in Second Sabor. He was to provide temporary Episcopal leadership. The Sabor was held in three cities, just to give all three cities a chance to be able to see it. So, Shahadi is in the bottom here. These are the very first three priests uh, that will be, accept, uh, be elevated in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada. The three S priests, Father Sochuk, Samets, you Torontonians know Samets because he's for a long time here, and Stratichuk, and there is Alexander Nemolovsky. At the very top, one of the godfathers of our church is uh, Father Sochuk, so I have a picture of him when he was a young seminarian and then when he was in his prime, uh, probably a picture from about 1980. At the third Sabor, again in three cities, Germanus attended for the first time. Seven clergy, a large number of life, and began to effectively strategize the future. This included opening new parishes, training new clergy, hopefully establishing a church newspaper, a press, and beginning contacts with both the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Poland as well as under Ukraine. So remember, this is uh, just a year before the Ua Petsa Sabor of 1921. In November 1919, a seminary was established in Saskatoon. They founded a learned priest by the name of Father Lazar Hedman, by the way, from Bukovina, Romania, you know, that territory, for some of the Bukovinci in the audience. Three of the earliest graduates were the three S priests that I mentioned. 
And um, basically, Father Sochuk becomes sort of the major leader in the church for many years. He's the administrator. And even later, he becomes the principal of St. Andrew's College. One of my colleagues at the University of Manitoba wrote a little booklet on, uh, on, on Sochuk. If somebody wants to pick it up, I'll have a few available later on. Some other notable developments. The first vernacular liturgy. Me govorila moje poparedi se govorila pro ukrinizaciju u Ukrajini. Me malo tako samo ukrinizaciju u Kanadiji. Po to smo reklamali naši starši sveštenik i liturgiju. On June 18, 1922, the first liturgy was celebrated. We have the election of the first Ukrainian bishop, Archbishop Ion Teodorovich, in 24. He comes from the UAPC hierarchy of 1921. Winnipeg was established as the capital for the church. The beginning of Pravoslavni Visnek, later renamed Visnek, begins the Aymanach Ridna Neva. Ukrainian Orthodox Church tradition officially registered by an act of Canadian Parliament. This is very important. The Narodovci wanted our church to be a Canadian institution to be chartered through Ottawa. In other words, the Parliament had to read major, major statute of incorporation and we have the statute as such, such from 1929. I'm not going to give you the rest of the history, but let's take a look a little bit of the ethos. What were the formative <coughs> ethos and tenets of our church? What was the importance of each? What has happened over the past 95 years to each of the tenets, characteristics of our church? The first one I want to mention is Soborno Pravnius. Soborno Pravnius, or conciliarity, was established always and all these meetings as the highest shared governance model for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. In some cases, they even describe nam trava demokratichnitsa. I don't like using the word democratic and theological you know, in, institutions, but it's there, and it's in Ukrainian voice in many of the newspapers. Very high. <clears throat> importance was placed on church councils. We have had in our church 22 councils every five years, and we've also had eight extraordinary sabors. So you get a chance to see that over our 96 year history, we've had 30 sabors, approximately one sabor every three years. So Bordo de Prangis um, emphasized the shared governance model with the consistory with bishops, clergy, and laity. In the beginning, there was a ratio of one cleric for every laity, and this has remained to the present. In 1919, there were four clergy and four lay leaders elected to the consistoria. Eventually, by 1951, we have uh, an opportunity to elect nine clergy and nine laity, along with the bishops forming the consistoria. The same model applies also to the, um, the tradition of the um, presidium of the consistory, which also has um, what we would call two, two a men of the cloth and two secretaries who happen to be usually the late. By the way, we talked a little bit about the role of women in the church. The first consistorsky chlan was uh, a woman out of Edmonton, so yet Antonius can be proud. She was elected in 1970. And ever since 1970, we've had two, three, four, one female on our consistorium. The unique feature of this encounter was that the state had no role in Soborno Um There was, as there was during the period of Russian Empire, Austro-Hungarian, Polish-Lithuanian state, all of these states. Um, and this worked well. We really had a church governed and sustained and driven by the church. No interference of any state or provincial government or federal government in Canada. Number two. Ukrainianization, Ukrainian cultural values, and eventually we interest in, in, will introduce some general Canadian values. The norm of the use of the Ukrainian language was introduced very quickly. From, you know, let's drop church Slavonic, let's use modern vernacular in Ukrainian. Early translations of liturgy were done. The Ukrainsky uh, holos was already in its masthead known as Ukrainsky holos. The Narodovci made sure of this. Uh, schooling was very, very important. We had in Western Canada bilingual schools from 1905 to 1916. Who were the teachers? Well, it was the most Narodovci. They were there teaching in these little one-room schools, half day in Ukrainian, half day in English. We had already Bursa, 
The Bursa concept comes from this sort of idea of residential schools. So we're going to have students move off the farms and go to universities, become teachers and doctors and lawyers. Let's give them a sarapa where they could continue with their Ukrainian culture. So the Bursa role played a tremendous role. Uh, those students, that, those uh, former alumni that are here from Saskatoon, you probably tell us a few stories about your Bursatsky chasse. Because I think some, for some people, these were the most important three, four, five years in their lives. The Ukrainian Eastern Christian calendar was also part of the value system with a strong emphasis on the Julian calendar. Our church in Canada has never wavered. Up to today, we still use the Julian calendar. Slowly, a number of Canadian practices and holidays were introduced, such as Thanksgiving, Remembrance Day, and Mother's Day. And we've given it a little bit of a religious twist. We have a Deng Matri concept, you know, on the Sunday closest to Mother's Day. We introduced, um, you know, some of our traditions may have died. I especially am very proud that we will be able to maintain the second puja in Canada. You know, by January 18th, and you know, we started with Sete Mikolai on the 19th of December, there was a Mises, but we've been able to keep the second puja as Yurdanska Vichara as a parish communal celebration. The calendar in the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada is an annual cycle that many remember with the church cycle, the 12 major feast days and the other days like Pokrova, the national cycle interwoven into this. And of course now we are adding other dimensions to this cycle. We have now Holo de Mormont and Holo de Mordain, Deng Nezalash still has been added. And we are now working on a day for the internment in October. And I misspelled October. Better question. Drukarski Chorte. Next, I want to talk about this ethos, and that is um, canonical hierarchical leadership. We need some orderliness in the church. And so, as a result, okay, this is our situation. From the beginning, you notice I mentioned we went trying to get a canonical bishop from the Russian Orthodox mission. We then went, he, he did not want to be with us, so we went and had Girman of Shehadi. And then, of course, in 1921 uh, 24, Father Sochuk, in fact, traveled to Poland, traveled to eastern Ukraine to try to find a suitable candidate. He couldn't find anybody. So, as a result of the departure of Shehadi, our church accepted as a hierarch on a temporary basis um, one of the ordained new bishops of the Uopetsa of 1921. His headship lasted for two, two decades. He usually visited Canada during the summers, did some ordination, did a lot of Kramoviciata, but he was very well regarded in Canada and uh, very much uh, celebrated. Um, but at the same time, during this period, we also had a, two tremendous debates. First of all, Metropolitan Yuan decided to reconsecrate itself. In other words, he wanted to find a method of, and this of course created great problems, because if you say now you want to be reordained, reconsecrated, and you're already consecrated, what happens? Number two, there was a major, major debate. Father Sochuk and Mr. Svistun had a major debate about the canons of 1921. And as a result of that, Mr. Sustun had to leave our church, Father Sochuk won. But I want you to say to see that there were tensions in the church about 1921. It wasn't an easy matter, but yet it came out very, very well at the end. So with the departure of uh, Metropolitan Ioan Dorovich, our church initiated to bring four potential candidates from the DP camps, and we're very successful of getting Mikhail Horoshi, Mrs. Slav Skrepnik, in fact, he was the head bishop in Canada for four years. And then eventually in 1951, Ilarion Ohienko, the bishop of Kholm, who came from Switzerland to Canada. Um, this was very, very important, to have canonical leadership from the DP camps, from the displaced people's camps. They came to Canada and helped us restructure our hierarchical tradition in Canada. I was one of the last pupils of Metropolitan Ilarion, Mitropoliti Larion, I believe, was a tremendous um, person. He did much for our church over his two decades. Um, in Ukraine, they have rediscovered Larion. 
you know, there's a major center at the, the Kaminesk-Podiski University for Ilarion. Ilarion actually elevated our church greatly. And from 1951 to, to the present time, we've had a whole series of metropolitans, and I won't give you the list. Um, on the bottom here, you can see metropolitan um, um, Mr. Slav Skrepnik. This was before he took the title Patriarch in Ukraine. St. Andrew's College have honored him with an honorary doctorate. So Metropolitan Vasily Tadak is presenting him with his doctoral hood and also his parchment. No, Strong Ukrainian Orthodox Church historiography. You know, the pioneers in the Zardotsi, they were not historians of the top class. But yet, somehow they had learned enough to have a simple Ukrainian Orthodox historiography that differentiated from the Russian. This plays an important role because many of the articles were about Kazachina, Kievska Rus. We had articles about Halisko, Volenska, Derzhava, and the, and the uh, Lvivska, Lvivska Metropolia, Halitska Metropolia, Litovska Metropolia. So we developed in Canada through a simple sort of a process. I mentioned here in my fifth point, can you imagine in Canada a bursa being established mostly by Ukrainian Catholics and they're calling it Petron Mohel, a bursa. You can see here some of the traditions as they sort of unfold. We also knew our negative periods. So I put on the bottom because, you know, it's one thing to know the positives, but you also have to know the negatives. Another important uh, tradition for our church was strong institution building of the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada. So the Narodotsi were responsible for a seminary. We had a seminary already in the 1920s, small, not too many students, but in Regina and Saskatoon, we subsequently had courses in Winnipeg, and then in 1946, St. Andrew's College, which was in the north end of Winnipeg, and later transferred to the University of Manitoba. If you want to have a church, you better train clergy that will witness to the tradition that you are part of. Church newspaper, I put on the bottom there, the first six years of Grinsky Hollows was the unofficial, what we can call paper of our church, but then we produced our own Disney, and we stole the editor from Ukrinsky Hollis, who by that time was already ordained a priest in 1923, Kudrek, and so as a result, he plays this important role. We have a church central office, the Consistory in Winnipeg. It's kind of interesting. It's um, close to a park. On one side of the park, we have our all-Canadian cathedral. On the other side of the park, we have our consistory offices as such. Major parishes. In Canada, what we had done till 45 was very, very well organized, about 160 parishes. But boom, after World War II, all of our major cathedrals, major parishes, major cities, major centers, is beginning after the war. Many of our people decided to begin the process of urbanization. So I wanted to point that out because I think it's important that we need those major parishes of five, 600 families we needed those parishes that could, in fact, promote in the major cities where people were moving into. Well, a couple of challenges there. Okay, let me just do my conclusion. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church history is a strong testament of the tenacity of Ukrainians in Canada to create, recreate a major religious tradition modeled in the past in Ukraine. It is certainly modeled, but yet with a significant Ukrainian-Canadian element in the structure. Number two, the early Narodotsi enlightened clergy and laity laid a strong foundation that is still a cornerstone for us in Canada. The numerous awards and consistory headed by bishops, archbishops, metropolitans over the past 96 years have been fundamental to the development of the ethos of the Great Orthodox Church of Canada. Also, I want to give credit to the chairs of the Presidium. All the chairs of the Presidium were clergy over these 96 years played a major role along with the clergy and the laity consistory board members. Basically, I'm trying to say, somehow from the inside, we're able to elect the best people we can find to be able to be in the, the world of administration for our church. And lastly, I want to say, um, today, a lay organization called the Ukrainian Self-Reliance Association of Canada has its beginnings in the late 20s, early 30s, and its member, Sous Organist, has initiated and organized this symposium as a response to the needs of the church in 2014.
just like the laity, the Narodotsi did in 1918 at the confidential meeting in Saskatoon. I believe the first event as well as this weekend's events are important pillars in the history of Ukrainian Orthodoxy in Canada. One was a confidential meeting, this certainly is an open meeting. You know when we do these PowerPoints, uh, many times people say, well that the check out to information where you get this information. So I prepared for you three slides of excellent material and books and pamphlets and articles. So if you have a chance, buy them, purchase them. We'll have some of these for sale and for our guests from Ukraine, we'll be giving away some of this. We produced a very nice uh, DVD on our Ukrainian millennium. We produced a DVD on our Ukrainian Orthodox um, celebrations of our 75th anniversary. So there's some electronic tools. You know, every professor's got to humbly present himself. So there's a couple of things that I've done. Um, this, is a, this is from the SUS organization of two scratch in Winnipeg, produced a little history. We're very proud. St. Andrews College has a theological journal. You all know that every theological school needs a theological journal. So Mitropoliti Larion had a journal called Vire Cultura. When he passed away in 71, we took over Mitter Brav. And we've, been, we've now issued 15, and I'm very proud to be the editor of the 16th volume, and that's the one that's going to include all the dogweeds we heard yesterday, today, we'll hear tomorrow, and on Sunday. Thank you very much.